Hello and welcome to the National Complete Streets Coalition's webinar series, Implementation and Equity 201, The Path Forward on Complete Streets. Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon or morning for our webinar, People Are Dying on Our Streets, Why Is This Happening and How Can We Talk About It Responsibly, co-hosted by Smart Growth America and the National Complete Streets Coalition, and we're joined today by the Detroit Free Press and Streets Blog USA. My name is Emiko Atherton, and if I haven't met you yet, I serve as the director of the National Complete Streets Coalition, which is a program of Smart Growth America. We work all over the country to really create safe places uh, for people to walk and roll, whether you are on foot or in a wheelchair or on a scooter or on a bicycle. And one of the ways that we've been doing this over the years is really looking at uh, pedestrian infrastructure over the last uh, few decades. Um, what do we know then? Uh, as I mentioned, we've been tracking pedestrian fatalities um, since the early 2000s. And what we've seen, and the chart before you shows, is that Unfortunately, pedestrian fatalities are on the rise. And if you've been following this, this is unfortunately not new news to you. We had a slight dip during the Great Recession because we had less people in cars and on foot traveling to work or not our discretionary trips. But as our economy rebounded, so did the number of people we were killing while walking on our streets. Um, most recently, we've seen a 46% increase in the number of people killed while walking, even though we know that traffic fatalities overall are going down. Um, one of the ways that we've been looking at this in the National Complete Streets Coalition is through our biannual report, Dangerous by Design, which looks at the most dangerous places to walk in the United States. Um, for those of you that followed the 2008, or I'm sorry, it was the 2006 release of Dangerous by Design, one of the things that we learned was that traffic fatalities and really pedestrian fatalities disproportionately impact um, vulnerable populations. So the things that we know so far are even though traffic fatalities are going down, pedestrian fatalities are on the rise and we're killing people of color and older adults. More, um, more than we are killing others. Um, one of the things that, that, um, <clears throat> that we learned in Dangerous by Design was that people of color are 54% more likely to be killed while walking. This chart shows you that, um, for instance, uh, Native Americans are 4.52 uh, more represented in pedestrian fatalities than white non-Hispanics are Asians. We also know that for older adults. Older adults are 55, 51% more likely to be killed while walking. And here we can look at the pedestrian inger, danger index, which shows your relative likeliness to be struck and killed. Again, goes significantly up for those uh, 65 years of age or plus or those 75, 75 years of age or older. Um, as these pedestrian fatalities continue to rise, we've seen a lot of negative attention towards pedestrians in the media. Uh, we've seen a lot of victim blaming. We've seen a lot of blaming on distracted driving. Um, those of you who follow the Governor's Highway Safety Association's report on pedestrian safety, they recently made a claim that pedestrian fatalities were rising in states where marijuana legalization was happening. Um, but really, we, we know at Smart Growth America and the National Complete Streets Coalition, but by continuing this narrative of victim blaming and blaming people on foot and on bicycles, it in no way puts our cities and our governments and our departments of transportation and our elective fields on notice for the fact that street design it is what street design and vehicles are what, kill, what are killing people, not a distracted pedestrian or marijuana legalization. Um, two recent articles came out that are really starting to de deep dive into all of this. And uh, the first one uh, was Death on Foot, America's Love of SUVs, which is Killing Pedestrians, uh, was put out by the Detroit Free Press. And then um, Angie Schmidt, who has done a lot of work to cover complete streets and pedestrian fatalities and safeties, uh, put out an uh, article called No Drunk Walking is Not the Cause. Uh, is not causing the rise in pedestrian deaths. 
Um, so we're going to really hear from the, from uh, those two news outlets today, and I'd like to introduce you first um, to Angie Schmidt, who is <clears throat> the editor of Streets Blog USA, a national news site devoted to the movement for urban transportation reform. She has a master's degree in urban planning from Cleveland State University and is a former newspaper reporter. She lives in Cleveland and is a mom of two. Hi. Hi, Angie. And then we have Eric G. Lawrence, who writes about autos and transportation mobility issues for the Detroit Free Press, covering topics ranging from Fiat Chrysler automobile news to electric and autonomous vehicle development and pedestrian safety. Eric has also written extensively on efforts to create a regional transit system in Metro Detroit. Eric joined the Free Press in 2008 and is a graduate of West Virginia University. He and his wife, who is also a journalist, have a six-year-old son. And then we're going to last hear from Christy Tanner. Christy Tanner, Ph.D., is a data analyst and reporter at the Detroit Free Press. Tanner's research interests include urban politics and policy. She is also an adjunct professor at Wayne State University, where she teaches graduate-level statistics. She has years of experience in data analysis in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. She earned her PhD and Master's of Public Administration at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. So thank you, Angie, Eric, and Christy, for joining us. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to Angie Schmidt uh, from Streets Blog. So take it away, Angie. Hi. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the way the media frames pedestrian deaths because I think it's a big problem. Um, we had about 6,000 pedestrian deaths last year, um, which is an enormous number. To put that in perspective, we only have about 3,500 fire deaths annually in the United States. And we have, you know, we have fire departments in every city that are set up to prevent those. And meanwhile, this other issue is just sort of under the radar. We, we've sort of just come to accept these deaths as part of the background of our daily lives. Um, and I think part of the reason is we just haven't had, we, we haven't had a consciousness raising event about this yet. Um, but I think we can learn from looking at other issues that are covered more sensitively in the press, some lessons, and I'm going to talk about why press coverage is so important and some of the common mistakes that I think reporters make. Um, so to start out, I don't think that reporters are being malicious. Um, I used to be a newspaper reporter. I, I actually worked at the Toledo Blade, um, which is sort of near where the rest of the reporters on this call are doing reporting. And um, I, I worked for other papers as well, and I covered – there's sort of a tradition that newspapers of covering, at least the ones I worked at, they would want to cover every fatality. So – I would be covering the police beat at night, you know, if I had a night shift. And if someone died, it would come over the police scanner. And we would always, the rule was to always write about every traffic fatality. And we would write a couple sentences. It, was, it would take five to ten minutes. Um, that was just sort of a common practice. We didn't really dig in. Um, we treated all of them as sort of isolated incidents. We sort of took whatever the explanation was, the official police explanation, sort of at face value. Um, and, that, and so we would be, we devote a lot of space to covering these deaths, but again, it, the coverage was very superficial. And I think that that kind, of, that kind of coverage is a problem. And it's an obstacle to addressing this issue in a more systemic way. And we've lost a lot of ground in recent years. So um, one thing that I think is a really great reference for everyone was the Columbia Journalism Review wrote a great article um, in April of this year, and they talked about the big mistakes reporters make when they're covering pedestrian and bicycling deaths. And there were, um, the headline says, when covering car crashes, be careful not to blame the victim. There's sort of an impulse, um, and it goes back historically – um, you probably, some of you may be aware, historically, streets were more multimodal. They had a function that was more than just a place for moving cars. Um, before cars became the dominant mode of transportation in cities, people would play, in the, children would play in the street, or people would stop and have a conversation in the street, you know, getting on uh, the streetcar or whatever. Eventually, all of those 
um, all those other activities were eventually supplanted by what we have now, which is mostly in the common conception, cars or roads are just a place for cars to drive through quickly. And um, that's just a wider cultural bias, and our reporters have sort of internalized that. So there's sort of an impulse. I think, to when, when a pedestrian or a cyclist is killed, what were they doing wrong? And to deflect, victim, to deflect blame back on the victim. And the Columbia Journalism Review warned about that. Um, so I'm just going to tick through some of the common mistakes that reporters make. And as advocates, I don't know exactly who's on the call, but if you're an advocate um, these, or if you work for a city government, these are good things to keep in mind in your own um, dialogue and your written, your written conversation about this. So um, one key thing we recommend is not calling these crashes, and this goes for motor vehicle crashes that involve no pedestrians and cyclists as well. It's, it's not a good practice to call it an accident. An accident implies no one is to blame. Um, it's sort of an act of God. Um, and I even saw this news uh, in a case recently I was looking at yesterday where the driver was charged with negligent homicide. The reporter is still calling it an accident, even where there's criminality involved. So that, that's really something reporters should be getting away from. Um, the Associated Press changed their – Associated Press is a style guide for reporters. It's sort of like the Bible of how to write. Um, specific um, syntax rules for reporters. And they recently changed their recommendations. They no longer recommend using um, accident in a case where negligence or potential criminality was involved. Hopefully, eventually, they'll go farther than that. Um, and the, the Associated Press often revises their style guide based on recommendations from, from advocates for different groups. So um, they've changed, for example, how they recommend reporters refer to older people. They recommend not using the term elderly because that's not as sensitive now, but they recommend using older adults. So there's changes all the time that reflect better societal understanding of the problem, and we're getting there on that, but we still have a ways to go, and hopefully they'll evolve farther. Um, another thing that they do that's a mistake, I think, is discussing the victim's clothing. If someone was walking, were they wearing dark clothing? Um, I'm going to talk about a case later where they blame the victim because he wasn't wearing special reflective gear. Um, there's no legal requirement that pedestrians wear special equipment to move around, and um, that's just sort of an unfair and insensitive way to respond. And it's sort of... Um, in the past, if there was a sexual assault, a rape, for example, that's the kind of thing that might be brought up. What was the victim wearing? We see the same now. I think most people would recognize that's an inappropriate framing to talk about a sexual assault case. Um, hopefully, we'll have a breakthrough where we, sort, we start to realize that's sort of an inappropriate way to frame a pedestrian death as well. Um, another thing, a big problem, a lot of reporting ignores street design. So they'll say the pedestrian wasn't in a crosswalk, but they'll never investigate, was there a crosswalk nearby? How far would that person have to walk to reach a crosswalk? Do, does the, do the police understand that, technically speaking, every intersection is an unmarked crosswalk? Um, there, another problem is using the passive voice um, or naming the car as the, as the actor and not the driver. So those are all things that sort of shift blame and make the issue appear unsolvable, unsolvable or more sterile and less violent than it is. Um, if we could advance to the next slide. Let's see. Oops, sorry, I should have checked how to do that. Here we go. Um, so here we have a map. Gotcha, thanks, sorry. <laughs> here is a map of um, Rockford, Illinois. Somebody who's actually on this webinar sent me this, and it's so awesome because I was looking for a map just like this. 
Um, but 40%, he did an analysis of where crashes were occurring in Rockford. And if you look at this map, there's a very clear pattern. 40% of crashes that happen in Rockford are happening on just three arterial roads. Um, we've known, and this is a big point that's made in the Dangerous Spy Design Report that was discussed earlier, arterial roads, especially roads that mix low-income housing and retail are the most dangerous place for pedestrians because they're there is high traffic that moves relatively quickly, and there's a lot of destinations that people are going to want to access on foot. So that's one thing for reporters. Reporters can miss when they're covering every crash as a sort of superficial, quick item day after day. They're never connecting the dots and seeing that, hey, there's a pattern here, and this is a systemic issue that relates back to design. And then if we could advance again to the next slide. So here's an example I want to talk about. Um, this is a, uh, a guy that was killed, Arnolfo Sal Salazar. He was killed in Charlotte on May 30th. So I just want to talk a little bit about the way the press discussed this event. So here, this is a picture. These are two pictures of him I took from a GoFundMe page that his family set up. They were devastated. He was killed. He was killed by um, an off-duty police officer who was driving a patrol car. And the, the summary written up by the press, they blame him um, pretty explicitly. Um, they say he wasn't in a crosswalk, which is not unusual. They say he wasn't wearing reflective clothing, and they say he ran into the path of the police car. Um, so that's fine, and I, reporters depend on police and report the things police say about crimes all the time. But this is an example of where I think the press really messed up, and they should have questioned some of the things, some of the points the police made. For example, um, this guy was 80 years old and they say he ran in front of the police car. There was, no, there was really no questioning of that in any of the media accounts I saw. So that seems unusual. Do 80-year-old people running around is not sort of a common thing. Why, why did he run into the path of a police car? Was he suicidal? Um, are they implying that he was mentally unwell? His family says he was... Um, very active and walked around all the time. Um, so we don't, we don't get any questioning of that narrative that he just ran into the path of the cruiser from the press. This, this idea, he wasn't wearing reflective clothing. So again, this was reported by the across media accounts in good faith, but then his daughter points out he was killed at 6 p.m. It was broad daylight. So why would he be wearing a reflective vest? And again, that's sort of an unreasonable expectation for a regular pedestrian. Most of us don't have special clothing that we don to leave the house. The other question is, was there a crosswalk at all anywhere around? And if we could advance the slide again. So yeah, here's, I couldn't pinpoint exactly where he was killed, but this is, this is the general area where he was killed. He stepped off the median at some point and was struck by this police cruiser. Um, so as you can see, this is, a, this is a very wide road. If you're an 80-year-old person, you might have difficulty nav navigating this road. And this is the kind of place where people are getting killed all over the country. So um, press coverage to do better needs to bring up the fact, hey, the road he was killed in is eight lanes wide fast moving traffic, it's an important part of the story. Um, so I think that might be my last slide. Could you, is, is that the last slide? Oh yes. So, um, so just to close, I wanna talk a little, a little bit about what we can do about this to help reframe the narrative and um, make this issue a little more salient for the public and get some kind of results and some justice for the people that are put in this position. Um, and one thing I would recommend if you're an advocate uh, is just direct outreach to the press. 
So if you're your reporter in your town, there's you know, there's thousands of reporters, professionals like me and and the co can't be reaching out to every single one of them. But if we have advocates or pedestrians in these cities and you see a report that does blame the victim or makes some of these mistakes, I think it's good to just actually reach out to them personally and just try to help better educate them about why the way they're framing this matters, what might be the larger patterns. And one thing I recommend is this Columbia Journalism Review article makes a really good jumping off point. This is an industry publication, very respected, saying be careful about making these mistakes. And again, this article is called When Covering Car Crashes, Be Careful Not to Blame the Victim. And you can Google it. And if you send that to your reporters, hopefully we can help um, make the conversation a little bit fairer and help get justice for some of these people. Thanks so much, Angie. That was great. Um, you know, for those of you that don't follow Angie's work, I highly encourage you to do so. I, like I said, we're big fans of her at Smart Growth America in a way because she's changing the narrative about how we talk about pedestrian fatalities um, or really vulnerable user fatalities overall. As long as we continue to perpetuate um, these false narratives of, and putting victims at blame, uh, I think the general public and our elected officials, again, are going to continue to view um, are going to continue to view that narrative as the dominant narrative. Uh, now we're going to hear from Eric and Christy at the Detroit Free Press, who again really put out this outstanding article about how SUVs are killing uh, Americans. And to me, the first time I read this, it was a huge um, takeaway because I think seeing um, that the federal government knows that SUVs are killing people and at the same time is doing nothing, nothing about it has been a huge issue. And here they really did some fantastic investigative journalism uh, to dive deeper into the story. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Eric and Christy. Hi, thanks a lot. Um, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to come talk about this. Um, uh, this story kind of started uh, looking at the, the kind of this dramatic increase in pedestrian fatalities, and um, I would say that we, we started talking about it. We made some assumptions that a lot of other folks probably have, have made as well. Uh, we thought we would find that uh, this would be a distracted walking meets uh, distracted driving story. Um, and while both of those uh, issues are factors in the, in the, in the fatalities, uh, we found this uh, striking information about uh, SUVs, and uh, it may seem intuitive that this is uh, that you know SUVs might uh, play a role because there are more SUVs on the road. Um, we we didn't realize that there was would be much information out there, and it just so happened that um, w as we were doing the reporting on this, a uh, study came out from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety that kind of uh, reinforced this idea. And it found that in their, in their case, they found an 81% increase uh, in, in these kind of fatalities involving SUVs. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Christy to talk Perfect. about some of the statistics. Hi, I'm Christy Tanner. I'm the data reporter here at the Free Press. Um, I, got, um, I got involved in this project when Eric walked over to my desk and said, hey, we're going to look at these numbers. You want to help? And I said, sure, I love data. Uh, so just briefly, because um, Emiko has already talked about these numbers, um, this is the number of pedestrian fatalities over time. You'll see the dip in 2009. That's actually the lowest point since 1975 when the data collection first began um, for this data set. Uh, so that was 4,109 fatalities, or for those of you that appreciate statistics, we know that the population is growing. Um, the United States. So this rate was also the lowest rate of fatalities, which is not included here, my apologies, 1.3 per 100,000 um, residents in the U.S. So that's 1.3 um, pedestrian fatal crashes um, per 100,000. That's the low point. And then just in 2016, which are the most recent data um, available, uh, just under 6,000, 5,987 total fatalities. And the rate um, given the size of the population and the change in population over time, it's now 1.9 per 100,000 residents. So not only has obviously the number of fatalities increased, and that's kind of what uh, 
that got us look, looked into the story in general, got us interested in the story over time, um, but obviously also the rate, as well as um, what, our, what our other uh, earlier slides looked at, um, looking at the overall share of um, fatal accidents, fatal crashes. Sorry about that. Um, I get confused a little yeah. bit, and I have to take a look at, um, at our earlier presenter's point. The data set that these come from is actually called FARS, the Fatal Accident Reporting System. So it is really hard for reporters. We'll still, we're still learning the process, and we do make mistakes. So I do agree um, with the advice to um, call out your reporters when you see any um, omissions, errors, or things that you want to add or, or correct in a story, um, anything that you want to add in a reporting. We do like calls, and we do like to talk to reporters, to other colleagues and other folks in the field. Next slide. So when we started looking at the data, after we looked at the data over time, we took advantage of the actual NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. They've got a lot of data out there already compiled and analyzed on the web. If this is a topic that's of interest to you um, and you want more information about your local municipality, um, I actually went online and compiled. The reason why this is 2010 to 2016 is that the data are out there annually um, for all cities um, over 100,000 residents that um, have at least one pedestrian fatality. So this slide that you're looking at here is just 2010 to 2016. You'll see that Detroit had the highest rate um, for cities that had at least 200,000 in population, 34.5 um, pedestrian fatalities per 100,000 residents in Detroit over that 2010 to 16 time period. Um, so if you looked at the data and you cut it with just cities over 100,000 and you went to the website for that 10-year time period, um, Detroit would be number two, Fort, Fort Lauderdale is number one. Another thing to note about Detroit over time is that Detroit's kind of always been in the top 10 and just recently in 2016, um, we've um, actually improved in ranking, if you can call it improving. We went from um, ranking in 2015 um, among large cities, uh, number two, um, to uh, 2016, um, our rank was actually 23rd. Important to note, we'll talk further when we get to data about Detroit, that um, of those fatal um, pedestrian crashes in Detroit, there were 29 um, pedestrians that were killed in 2016 um, just last year. Well, two years ago, a quarter of those, um, a quarter of all fatal accidents are actually pedestrians, so much higher rate of crashes that are fatal that happen in Detroit um, involve pedestrians than nationwide. I think we're going to go to the next slide. Did a lot of stats and reporting um, in general, a lot of discussion on um, age and race. And this slide you'll see here um, just the difference on um, the disproportionate effect um, that um, is had the pedestrian accidents have on minority populations, specifically African Americans, American Indians, or Alaskan Natives. And this slide, just so you know, the way you interpret it, it's a little bit funky. Um, the base is not the percent of the population in the U.S. I actually, because um, a majority of fatal pedestrian crashes take place in urban areas. I actually pulled the Census Bureau data, just the data by race for urban areas, so you have a higher percentage of minorities in urban areas um, to compare against. And if you look and you want to maybe interpret um, possibly the first, the first bar, the black or African American, that bar shows, for example, that blacks made up or African Americans 20% of pedestrian deaths but only about 14% of the urban population in the U.S. That's a difference of roughly six percentage points. So there's an overrepresentation um, in the data of African Americans and Native Americans um, in the data of those that are, are killed for this time period. And this is the entire time period of our study, which includes an extra year, 2009 to 2016. We looked at all the data um, for pedestrian accidents. Another thing, too, on our data set, um, I don't know if most folks are aware. This is something that I learned um, when I was doing this research that I wasn't aware of. When I started looking at numbers and getting numbers to match up, that there's a very specific um, definition that NHTSA and the federal government uses for pedestrians. That includes um, people on foot um, or lying down the roadway, 
but it doesn't include people that are on personal conveyances if that are involved in a fatal motor vehicle crash. So a personal conveyance can be something like um, people on inline skates or um, a baby in a baby stroller or someone on a Segway device or someone on a motorized um, or non-motorized wheelchair or a scooter for those with disabilities, which is one of the fatal accidents that happened in downtown Detroit. Um, so just, just to clarify, those are just pedestrians on their feet, actually. And if you look at the number of pedestrians, which these data for this race slide includes, there's a little bit more. It's over 6,000 that, um, that were killed um, in 2016 um, by a motor vehicle. So just so you know, there is a slight difference, and I'll be noting if we kind of deviate from the two, this slide includes the full definition of pedestrians, which we included people that were either on skateboards or inland skates or, in, you know, baby in a baby stroller, nonetheless. I'm going to hand off to Eric. Yeah, uh, just, to, to, just to tag on to that, um, one of the interesting things uh, the, that had come up on that, that point was that in one of our uh, local communities here, when I had asked uh, about uh, about some of their efforts to to address this problem, I had asked for how many uh, how many pedestrian fatalities they had, they had, um. and they gave me a number, and then and Christy couldn't match it up, and so I'm always trying to match the data. <laughs> right. I'm like, Why don't I get that number? I can't get that number. <laughs> so which is a good which is a good thing, obviously. Um, so I went back to them and I asked, and uh, some of the some of the people that were included in that were actually cyclists. Yes. So, so that obviously wouldn't show up on the, the uh, national the numbers. numbers. So that's just, uh, just something to be aware of if you're looking into this. There's very precise definitions of pedestrians and, and, and pedestrians on personal conveyances when you do these analyses. Right. Sorry, go ahead, sorry. Yep. Okay, so uh, this, uh, this issue with SUVs, um, and again, we, we don't think that SUVs are the, the whole answer. We just think it's a very key factor, and it's, and it's noteworthy for the, for the increase uh, in, in, in the involvement in these, uh, these crashes. Um, uh, it's, been, it's been reported pretty widely for, for some time that SUV sales have been going up uh, in this country. Uh, they've, they've surpassed um, sedans, actually, the top selling vehicle. Um, currently, it's, we didn't have good numbers on the, on the total uh, vehicle fleet, so, we, so the, the, uh, the information that we put out refers to vehicle, vehicle sales, not the actual cars and, uh, and SUVs on the road. Um, so it takes, it takes uh, about 10 years uh, on average for the fleet to turn over. So um, even though you'll see uh, SUVs or uh, sales are, are way up, You'll see that um, there's, you know, just you know, you know it from driving around. You'll see older cars on the road, so so those older cars are still are still in play. Um, you can move on to the next slide. Um, and what we found uh, it seems seems pretty obvious if you if you if you, if you think about it, um, but this 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 slide pretty 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 well illustrates what you would see. And of course, I, I've noticed since we started uh, reporting on this, when I, when I look at the front ends of vehicles, I, I notice how, how high and blunt uh, an SUV is compared to a car. But you can see kind of where, uh, where an SUV, typical SUV, might come up to a person um, versus a passenger car. The, the point of impact would, would tend to be higher. Um, so uh, to talking to some, uh, to talking to a, uh, an emergency room uh, doctor, about the kinds of injuries that might come from getting hit by an SUV, by, by, a, by a, a vehicle higher up, you tend to maybe get hit in the chest uh, versus, um, versus lower down. And of course, injuries to your chest or if your child getting hit in the head, you know, would be, would be more serious. Um, in fact, I was out um, to, to kind of illustrate some of the stuff. I went out to uh, a couple of car dealership lots to, uh, with a tape measure and was measuring uh, the front ends of uh, some of the SUVs and, and sedans, and you know, really some some sedans, the top just kind of come as you, as you can see here, it just kind of comes up to maybe the bumper on, on some of these uh, some of these SUVs, and even some of the larger vehicles. If you look at some trucks, you know, it's even it's even more dramatic. Um, so if you get if you get struck that way, it's going to have a, a pretty serious uh, impact at a certain speed. Um, you can move on to the next uh, slide. Um, and as we were doing the, the reporting on this, um, 
uh, one of my one of our colleagues, uh, Nathan Bomey, who was also involved in this uh, reporting. He's, he works for uh, USA Today. He's a former Detroit Free Press reporter. Uh, he's part of the USA Today network. I came upon this uh, little little snippet. Um, I believe it was on page 90 of an almost 200-page uh, report, where it talked about uh, this this issue of of how um, accidents of how of how getting hit by an SUV uh, versus a car would would be would leave you two to three would be two to three times more likely to be fatal for pedestrian than a, than a car, um, and it, it was it was something it, that was buried uh, in this in this report. Um, it was on it was in 2015. So uh, so the federal government uh, regulators had known about this uh, in that in that time and uh, apparently hadn't hadn't done too much about it. Um, as I was doing the reporting, I came upon a, uh, a paper from 2001 that actually kind of envisioned this, uh, the change, both the change in the fleet and uh, the more serious uh, injuries that might, uh, might result. Um, so, uh, so people were looking at this, uh, w w had kind of envisioned this, and the, the, re the researcher who's now at uh, Virginia Tech, you know, he, was, uh, you know, he, he, he had thought about this before in terms of how uh, crashes involving SUVs uh, were more deadly for people and other other types of vehicles, and that's what kind of got him interested in this. But his, you know, he was saying basically it's a geometry problem. You know, this, these vehicles are higher and blunter, um, so they're they're like more likely to cause these kind of serious accidents. Um, and I, I, you know, if you can see it in this clip, but you know, it's it's even more deadly for a, for a child to be hit um, than it is for 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 an adult, as you can imagine. Um, you can move on to the next slide. Um, and uh, t in talking to different folks, uh, several of the, the uh, pedestrian advocates and uh, doctors, some other folks talked a lot about speed. Speed is clearly a factor. Uh, you can see in the slide that the probability of death goes up pretty dramatically. Um, so if you're going at a slower speed, um, you're more obviously a lot more likely to survive. Um, and then talking to uh, emergency room, one emergency room doc, he said that it's you know intuitive that a, that a larger vehicle would uh, would cause more serious in injuries, but of course you would prefer to be hit by a smaller vehicle than a, than a larger vehicle. But these are some th statistics uh, in terms of percentage that have been around for a, for a while, um, and uh, you can you can imagine um, what, say say if you're hit by a car if you're cross crossing an interstate versus cross you know. Getting hit by a vehicle on a on a small city street at a at a slow speed, it would be a, a dramatic uh, difference in your ability to survive that. In fact, we had a uh, horrible accident. Um, I, I I messed up there. Said accident. Sorry. <laughs> <A> crash. <laughs> yeah, crash. It, it, this one might be considered an accident. I don't know. Uh, some of the fault though. Uh, there was a uh, there was a, a girl who was who was struck and killed on uh, on an interstate. Uh, in the Detroit area here a couple of weeks ago, uh, she had gotten uh, she gotten out of the uh, car with her father was driving in, and uh, she was I believe her name, I believe she was seven. Yeah, well, the vehicle actually there was a, the, the vehicle ended up the car was disabled right the car there were her the car she was in was disabled so she got had gotten out of this uh, the the car assuming that her father was dead uh, was texting police trying to get help. And um, as she was as she was trying to get to get to safety or get help, she was struck by a, another vehicle on the interstate. Uh, this was uh, early in the morning. Uh, they couldn't figure out they, they they couldn't figure out initially where uh, you know where she was. And when they put it all together, they realized that this was a that this, this was a horrible tragedy. This young young child in a car with her uh, with her father who had gotten out, and just in the course of trying to get to safety, she was struck and killed on the highway. But you know that that again that would have been at highway speed, so her chances of surviving that would have been pretty pretty low, um, I imagine. Uh, you can go on to the next slide, please. Um, so so looking at the streets, um, a, a lot of a lot of folks who who talk design, talk uh, street, uh, the looks of streets, uh, note that. Uh, Streets, all street design in the past has focused a lot on you know just getting people from A to B, not specifically in cars. Um, you'd see a street like this in, in Seattle, 
um, which is which might be pretty typical with just a kind of a, a crossing. There's a there's a, a light there, um, divide not not even a divided highway, just uh, two two lanes of traffic each way. Um, but of course, as you know, if you're trying to cross a, a street, it's kind of tough, often even to get all the way across before the before the light changes. Um, but these are these are the kind of street designs that really don't take other users into account. But they're all over the country, and what we've found is that a lot of cities um, that are concerned about uh, making streets uh, more open to everyone, uh, bringing kind of making making the streets not just places to pass through, but also places where people can live and and even shop and move from part, place to place. Um, you want to you want to add a little bit of of, of additional features to make it safe and inviting. Uh, so this is something that was, was done in, uh, in Seattle uh, was on one particular street. Uh, they added uh, this, this kind of a central area, put, put in kind of a road diet to reduce the lanes. Um, you know, road diets, which are, which are popping up in different, different places, uh, you know, they, they reduce the lanes. They can reduce traffic speeds just by the fact that people don't feel as, as wide open. Uh, I know in, in Detroit, we've had this kind of interesting phenomenon where uh, a lot of the streets, uh, is, the city was built for more people, so we have a lot of wide open uh, areas. Uh, and, you know, now people have kind of discovered the, the, the benefits of being able to, you know, not just, not just uh, come downtown, Move around, but uh, biking and things like that. Uh, we have a, a big project on the east side of town um, to uh, to take a, a major thoroughfare between Detroit and the Gross Point communities, uh, put in a road diet, add bike uh, protective bike lanes, um, and uh, you know it's interesting that the kind of uh, pushback from some some from some folks who are unhappy that they can't go as fast as they used to on what. I believe the speeds are there is 35 miles an hour, but before they put in the road diet, and this is really just uh, over the last couple of months they've been, uh, you know, doing the striping and different things. Um, you can you can see a big difference in in the speed. Uh, presumably, it's the safety too. Um, but this is a, a road that got that's had a fair amount of traffic on it, um, but now you see uh, again uh, more 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 crossings. They're they're going to be putting in presumably some more mid-block crossings. Uh, and, and these, these bike lanes, which are, which are popping up more and more across the city. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, and here's a, an example of, of some of the things that can, can help. Um, uh, we had looked at some of, the, uh, some of the things that the different communities were putting into play, traffic cameras uh, for speed and, 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 and red lights. Um, and of course, that's it's an interesting d debate too with uh, with those kinds of cameras. Some folks are concerned about s surveillance, and uh, others are concerned about um, you know you, you, can they trust the can they trust the cameras um, that it, that it get me accurately? But you know those kinds of things will will, will slow people down and make them pay more more attention. Um, I, I know from my own experience, if I drive along in an area. Uh, you'll see it maybe on a, on a busier road sometimes where it'll, talk, it'll, it'll say traffic enforcement by, I'm not sure the wording, but by, uh, by, by camera. And I tend to certainly pay, uh, pay a little more attention as I'm, I'm driving, probably take it a little, bit, uh, a little bit more careful. But, you know, other things, you know, uh, offering, uh, offering refuge islands, um, things like that to, to give people a place to stop. Um, in Detroit, uh, you know, I'll keep referring back to Detroit because we're here, but uh, you know, they've, they've added a, they actually shut off a, a section of a, a kind of a main drag through town, Woodward Avenue, at the, kind of the foot of Woodward. Uh, they, they added a pedestrian plaza, and that had the, the dual benefit, um, both of offering a place for people to, to go and sit and, 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 and have, have lunch at a food truck or something, but also um, it benefited the street. We have a relatively new streetcar on, uh, on that street, and that probably uh, has helped Kind of cut down some of the traffic it's had to compete with, um, but uh, you know, just adding the, the kind of uh, pedestrian infrastructure that still allows people to get get through, but kind of makes them more aware and just makes it a little safer and more inviting for everybody else um, can can certainly make a community more livable, and uh, and presumably safer for pedestrians. If you can move to the next slide, please. Um, and then. 
talking to, to folks about some of the uh, technology that's, that's, that's in use, and this is one of the other things that we presumably will, will, will help. Uh, one of the uh, Department of Transportation uh, studies we looked at um, looked at uh, what certain types of automatic, uh, advanced automatic emergency braking with, the, uh, with pedestrian uh, accident mitigation technology could do. Uh, the estimate was that it could reduce uh, potentially reduce uh, eight, 810, I believe, fatal crashes uh, a year. Um, but right now, the, the, there are systems in place in different, uh, in different vehicles. Uh, it's not necessarily widely, uh, widely employed. It's expected to, to come out uh, more. Um, pretty much all the automakers, at least all the major automakers, have signed on by uh, 2022 to have some type of autom automatic emergency braking in place. Uh, for their fleet, but you know it's it's pretty wide uh, in terms of what the, you know, the requirements give them a lot of latitude. Uh, so it may not necessarily, in fact, it may not have a specific uh, technology to detect pedestrians. But uh, presumably, as the technology advances and more of it is in use in uh, vehicles, uh, that will become more of a, a factor. And uh, NHTSA has said they're working on uh, some some standards uh, for uh, for for this. Uh, now, but uh, one thing I wanted to mention too is uh, it's it's interesting if you look in uh, in Europe. I know we don't have a slide on that, but um, they actually uh, the, this, the safety agency that, that looks at this uh, looks at ratings actually provides uh, information on different cars, and you can look and you can pick a particular model, and you can see uh, how it rates on uh, on a whole range of things, but specifically pedestrian safety. Uh, you can see where on a particular car it's uh, worse for pedestrian, uh, and that's, that's marked off by little uh, red boxes, or better for pedestrians by a green box. Uh, so there are things that can be done, um, and you know, presumably we'll see more of the technology, you know, the, specifically the, the, this braking technology, which is a, a step toward autonomous or driverless vehicles. And presumably all the, vehicle, all the automakers are really rushing to, to, to move in that direction, so Hopefully that'll that'll be coming along more aggressively here in the future. We can move to the next slide, please. So we're wrapping up here, and we we just want to to um, I guess wrap up with a little bit more about Detroit because we're the Detroit Free Press. We do have other analyses online in the USA Today network, um, in the USA Today um, paper online with other cities and other maps. What this um, what this little point map shows. Kind of hard to see with the presentation, um, but it's actually um, a kernel density map where when you take the points, it just shades some areas darker where there's a higher density, just a count. So I looked at this a couple different ways because in Detroit we have um, a lot of data, obviously, about um, population and about traffic counts. Um, we looked at it a few different ways, and um, under, the under the deadlines that we had to publish, um, I got the same area as a hot spot on the east side of Detroit on Gratiot Avenue, no matter which way I did it. And the kernel density map is a pretty basic way of just counting these fairly rare events. Um, looks like a lot of points, and there are quite a few, because this is the 2009, 2009 to 16 time period. So these are all the, this is the location of all of the fatal crashes in Detroit from 2009 to 2016, including that expanded definition um, of pedestrians that may be um, using disability scooters or a wheelchair or maybe a, a young person um, on, or an infant in a stroller, for example. A um, couple of little quick points because I know we're running out of time. Detroit's different, we found, in some ways from the rest of the United States. Um, only 6% of the pedestrians killed by vehicles were identified as drinking, and there wasn't a lot of missing data on these fields. Some cities, um, that data, those data are not collected. Um, but for Detroit, those, da those data were there for a majority of the cases, enough to report that. Um, also, a higher, percent of, higher percentage of pedestrians were killed after dark in Detroit, 80 percent, compared with 72 percent nationwide over that same time period using that same definition, that larger definition of pedestrians, not the, um, the very finite one. Um, some similarities in Detroit, most pedestrians killed by vehicles in Detroit were male, 73 percent, and struck at non-intersection locations. The youngest victim was a one-year-old boy who was killed on the east side on Kelly Road, um, and the oldest um, was a victim that was 104 years old. So I think actually that was in New York. I'm sorry. The median age is 49. The youngest victim was one. 
Um, I believe the oldest victim was a female that was downtown um, Detroit um, that was killed in her 90s. So I don't have that memorized. Um, the one other thing I want to mention, just because our earlier presenter brought this, the example of Rockford, Illinois up in the presentation, is that um, part of the analysis is confirming or, um, or finding new trends in the data or surprises. And I kept reading those, these police reports that you can find online um, and with our local police departments on these accidents. And over and over again, everyone's like, oh, it's drinking, it's drinking. Well, I wasn't finding any drinking, but I was finding a lot of police reports that describe hit and run incidents um, in the city or crashes. So um, in the one statistic that we found in Detroit is that and nationwide, the rate of hit and runs is 18%. Again, using that pedestrians that includes those on personal devices over the 2009 to 16 time period. In Detroit, that was just under 50%. 46% of the fatal crashes in Detroit were hit and runs. The only city that I found that was higher um, was actually Rockford, Illinois, which was um, 58%, I think, over just over 50% of those crashes in that same time period were hit and run. Um, so there's um, there's some similarities and differences when you look at your local level. So if this is something that you're interested in, in working on and reporting on or improving the situation, definitely um, don't limit yourself to looking only at national trends, but I would say, you know, read these cases and investigate more to see how situations stand out. Take the advice of the earlier presenter and, and, and actually see what happened with the actual incident and compare notes with other researchers. Okay. Thanks so much, uh, Eric and Christy. That was a fabulous overview of the excellent investigative reporting that you did. Again, if you have not read this article, I highly encourage you uh, to do so. Um, but I also know many of you have questions, and to field these questions, I want to introduce Steve Davis, who is the Director of Communications at Smart Growth America and someone who has been telling me for years really all of the lessons about how to change the narrative and how to talk about uh, pedestrian fatalities. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to you, Steve. Great. Thanks, Emiko. It's great to be here. And I just want to thank uh, Angie and Christy and Eric a lot for sharing their time with us today. Um, the reporters and the media who, who talk about this, they have a huge um, role in shaping the public's understanding of what's happening here. And, um, and so I want to hopefully pull some questions out that are targeted to this great audience that we have here, these, uh, these guests with us. So um, we've got a lot of great questions then, and um, uh, Eric and Christy and Angie, feel free to answer as brief and as quick as you want to, to move it along. We'll see how many we can get to here in the time we have left. So um, uh, Barb uh, Chamberlain, hey Barb, uh, who asked a question about the data about the personal conveyance issue, which I actually was not aware of either. She notes that uh, it's interesting that NHTSA did not mention the exclusion of personal conveyance users in addition of the pedestrian crash data fact sheets before 2016. So where are those people included? Uh, she says uh, it may be even worse than we thought. Um, so wh where are the, uh, the other personal conveyance users included in fatality data? So this is Christy from the Free Press. And, you know, this, I'm not a, you know, I'm a data expert. And how I found the data are just looking at the fatal, the FARS, I call them the FARS fatal accident reporting system data files that NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration data, point to. There's, um, there's a field called pedestrian type, and then there is the other pedestrian, and there's a field for pedestrian. So they do supply the data and the raw data files. Uh, you just have to know what you're looking for. And I noticed, too, well, it's, it's great that they had that definition, and Barbie Wright, it's great that they have that in the report and they define that. But if without them noting it this year, I wouldn't have known. I mean, I did look for it, and I'm trying to figure out all the answers, because there's a lot of code, this very highly detailed data set. Um, you could get lost in the weeds very easily and quickly. But the data are out there online. You just have to kind of um, weave them all together with the unique IDs and create these master data sets. What was the, and you said, what was the uh, figure, do you recall? Um, I can look it up while we're talking for the over for the entire time period. I mean, for the depending on the data point that I'm looking at. It wasn't a it wasn't a huge number as a, a comparison. But it was a it was it was a you know it was a piece. Yeah, I'll look it up. Great, great. Um, and by, that kind of year six thousand one. It's about 6,000, it's 6,130 about. It depends on which variable I'm looking at. Some data are incomplete and complete. So there's a few hundred more 
2016 um, overall. So it adds a few hundred. It doesn't add thousands, but it adds a few hundred for just the last year's data. So instead of 5,987, it would be around 6,131. It depends on the variable I'm looking at because um, some are more complete or incomplete. So it adds a few hundred more. Oh, great. Thanks. Uh, and I think uh, these two, you can take them together maybe uh, for Eric here. We've got a question from Sh uh, Sean Sawyer about minivans, uh, where they are counted in here as SUVs or sedans, and then also uh, crossover, which I assume are SUVs. Uh, first question there, and then the second one I think was in reference to that academic report that you cited, um, the official source for the claim that pedestrians are two to three times more likely to suffer a fatality when struck by an SUV uh, from Ned. Sure, yeah, I, I believe uh, yeah, it's uh, understanding is that, that all those vehicles you referenced would be included in those, in those totals um, as, as, as SUV. Though I have noted that uh, I've seen on uh, registration paperwork that some uh, that's uh, the, maybe like a super outback might be listed as a as a uh, as a uh, station wagon. So how they how that ultimately figures out is uh, may not always be clear. And there's actually a code book online that tells you like if you want to get in the weeds for each model each year, like that can if anyone's interested, they can send me a tweet and I can send you to the code book and you can find how everything is identified. It's again more weeds, but go ahead, Eric. Right. And um, yeah, in fact, in that paper, uh, that paper that that we referenced uh, regarding the 2001 uh, ac academic paper, um, they they referred to them as light trucks, and SUVs were part of that that uh, that definition. Um, and then your question, what was your other question? I think that was it about the academic study. Um, for the two to three times more likely to be killed, and then the minivans. Oh, okay. So, so that's two two different things. So we had the the 2001 uh, report was a was a government report, and that was that was just envisioning this kind of change in the vehicle fleet and how that would probably be leading to more serious uh, injuries. Uh, the other the other report where it talks about um, a person being two to three times more likely to be killed. That was in a, uh, a report, I believe it was, uh, I believe it was NHTSA. Um, don't hold me to that, I'm sorry. I, I'm just going for, by memory, but it was a, it was a 2015 uh, uh, report. And if I'll look through uh, to see if I have that specific reference maybe while we're, while we're talking. But, um, but yeah, that was, a, that was, a, that was a federal government data. It was page 90 of this almost 200 page report. Great. We and uh, what like are your, Go ahead. Well, let me change the subject real quick. And, and uh, one question that's really important, I think, there's a lot of advocates and there's a lot of people that are interested in seeing better coverage um, locally. What's, what's the most effective way um, for local advocates, citizens, whoever, to, to press their journalists and press those that are, you know, the gatekeepers on this, on this issue with this coverage to change how they, um, how they report and, and write about these things and don't make some of the mistakes that, um, that Angie, you know, presented there at the beginning. How how can they um, encourage their reporters and not just, you know, send nasty emails that are going to be ignored? Well, I wouldn't say that. I, I, that's not necessarily a bad uh, tactic. <laughs> um, you know, we we you know we get a lot of uh, a lot of feedback on a whole range of things, but you know we know you know we know when we get so, someone who's very uh, very diligent and and if you know that whole that saying about the squeaky wheel and the grease. You know, if you if you hear from people um, on a regular basis, uh, you know that 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 can certainly raise awareness. Some some reporters might be there; they may not have covered a specific uh, issue before. So, you know, uh, the different reporters may be breaking news reporters, and they may you know they they're going on to the next story after they cover this you know hit and run or whatever. They may not uh, they may not really deal with it uh, very very directly, other than you know what they may have seen or, or heard before. So. Uh, they may just not not be aware. I think it's good to point these things out. Um, you know, just just you know, find out who the train, you know, who who covers transportation or uh, you know neighborhood level issues of your local uh, media outlet. Um, but just or who your data reporter yeah. is. We're pretty we're pretty picky on definitions, and we want to be correct um, when we're describing situations and. It is a little confusing, though, because the federal data, you know, there are there's some nomenclature issues, right? There's just, there's, and we're still catching up, right? The, the feds are still behind as well. 
um, as far as accident, calling it accidents versus crashes as well. So catch um, up. One I thing agree, I think I agree they can do. Uh, um, one, thing I, uh, one thing I think it's disappointing that reporters don't do more often is actually reach out to you guys. There are people who are professional advocates. Actually, there's hardly any considering the scale of this problem. There should be, you know, we have fire departments in every city, like I mentioned, that are dedicated to this issue. There's relatively few people who are out there as professional pedestrian advocates. And the police, sometimes there's a survivor bias. There's a lot of reasons. Um, the police reporting isn't as good as it could be, but um, I think one way to really improve it is to reach out to the experts, to people who are sensitive, like you, Steve, and Emiko, and uh, it's, it's sort of a shame that reporters don't do that more often. That's great. Thanks, Angie. And maybe one last question here for you. Um, how, how can we go about helping um, uh, maybe even police departments change their reporting reporting requirements, or you know, do you have any stories of success where um, you've seen uh, you know a police department, uh, kind of the public safety wing of the you know municipal services, change their approach to this issue in a way that's helpful, you know, producing better data, more accurate data, um, and uh, having the you know police department become perhaps an ally rather than feeling like um, they're on the wrong side of this issue all too often. So I don't know of any great examples in the United States. There may be some. I know that some law enforcement agencies have stopped using the term accident and switch to crash for their investigative units. The best example I know of is London. It's, a, it's not a U.S. example. But I know in London they have, uh, they have, their police department has a special investigative unit for investigating serious collisions. And, um, you know, it's not just a rote matter of, well, let's, check a few boxes, sort of blame the person who was killed, and they're actually trying, what are the root causes? And they're, they're charged not with just investigating, you know, criminal issues, so if there was drinking involved or speeding or something like that, but also what are the systemic causes? And if their investigation points to a systemic cause, they're charged with bringing that to the mayor of London so he can try to incorporate it into the Vision Zero policies that are aimed at eventually eliminating traffic deaths in London. So that's a most advanced case that I know of, but I did see something recently, and I can't remember where, that did recommend we need to change how we're doing reporting. It's um, the whole police reporting for collisions is based sort of on a car-centric model, and they should include more um, automatic entries that will help better describe um, the way pedestrians are getting hit and killed. Thanks so much, Angie. And thank you uh, again, all three of you, both Angie and Eric and Christy, for your excellent reporting and all that you do to really shape the narrative around pedestrian fatalities. I considered this a really highly valuable webinar, um, and we look forward to continuing our relationship and really learning from all of you and the good work that you do. Um, we were not able to get to all the questions today, but we will have a wrap-up webinar, or so blog post on the webinar where we'll be able to address more of the questions. I think Steve was furiously writing down all of the questions that were coming through the chat box. Uh, we'll try to get to many more of these. Uh, we also recorded this webinar so you can listen to it again. And I continue, uh, urge you to continue to follow all of our work. Um, for instance, our partner, uh, the State Smart Transportation Initiative, which is another program of Smart Growth America, has also been writing a lot about the rise in pedestrian fatalities and how to reverse that trend. Uh, you can visit their blog at ssti.us. And we will be um, hoping to put out another Dangerous by Design this year in 2018. As soon as that FARS data that Christy mentioned multiple times is released, it's typically released in the fall of every year. So we are patiently waiting uh, for that to come out. But we also can't do that report without your support. So please consider donating to get that report out on the streets. Uh, again, a big thank you to the three of you. I look forward to continuing to follow your work, and I hope all of you learned a lot and continue, um, and many of you who were on the webinar can um, 
continue to shape both the street design, the safety, and the narrative around pedestrians within your communities. And uh, we hope to hear from all of you soon. So thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.